Hi, Kevin Vish here. How you doing? Vish, how are you, my friend? Look at that Blues jersey, man. Sweet. I got it. It's uh, Wayne Gretzky's birthday. Gretzky, Happy Wayne. I saw it. One Happy of the, Wayne. One of the <laughs> rarest jerseys on the planet in terms yeah. of like he wore it for like two minutes. He didn't have it for long. I don't think he was really the captain. I, he, this no. says C. I feel like this is illegitimate, but I figured you would know. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're a walking lie. Everybody looks <laughs> just knows that's not true. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm a I'm a big fan. So thank you for this thank time. Uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I want to get to uh, this remarkable documentary. Uh, first of all, I wondered about the impetus for recording the the video for your parents in 1992. It's such a poignant moment. It uh, it obviously is foundational. Can you talk about why you chose to do that before you headed off to Vancouver? Yeah, it's so strange because it's like essentially it's a vlog. If you saw it today, you'd be like, oh, he, he recorded a vlog. But, you know, it's 1992 and there's no Internet yet, really, uh, other than maybe on college campuses. And um, I borrowed my uh, ex-girlfriend's uh, mom's uh, video camera and then sat down and kind of uh, gave this uh, like a dictated letter, like just talk to my parents through the camera uh, to say goodbye. And, and, and for some reason, I was like overwhelmed by the notion that this was it everything was about to change like you know i was going to go off and when i came back um perhaps be a famous filmmaker and um it's crazy because my sister for for years to make fun of me for it she's like that tape is so weird she's going because you literally predicted your future she's like you everything you talk about like kind of comes to pass, how'd you know? I was like, I, I didn't know. I was just like a 20, I was a knuckle, knuckle-headed 22 year old kid who, you know, wanted to get through saying goodbye to his parents without crying, which I would have if I was standing right in front of him. So I was like, I'm gonna give him this tape. And I remember my mom, my mom says it in the documentary and it, I love it to death, it makes me laugh. My dad passed away almost, uh, next year will be 20 years ago. But my dad, my mom said when he watched the tape, my dad was like, well, at least he thinks he's going to be famous. So that's something. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you like, I, I don't know. Did you make many videos like that one by, by chance? That was the only one. Oh, I oh. wish. I wish I was like, like Adam Goldberg, who makes the TV show, The Goldbergs. Yeah. When he was a kid, like he had a video camera and he just ran around shooting and he had tapes, tons of tapes. So when he pitched The Goldbergs, he showed this footage from some of the tapes. And the network is like, you literally have to end every episode with that footage. And so that's every episode of the Goldbergs ends with some real footage that came from Adam's personal collection. I, I you know, Adam had parents who loved him and gave him a VHS camera. I didn't have one, of, I didn't have parents like that. I had to borrow a VHS camera and then I had to give it back. So if, I believe if I would have had access to it 24 seven, oh, there'd be volumes like behind me of tapes of me just sitting there talking to the camera. Cause like, you know, I was a writer at heart. And so by that point, you know, I'm 22 years old. I had been writing pretty hardcore since I was nine years old. So here was another way to write, you know, without actually doing this kind of thing yeah. um, and just talking to the camera. So it really came out of a need to like say goodbye to mom and dad and thank them and heartfelt thank you. But it is kind of weird that like that kid, he had high hopes. Thankfully, the, they came true. Well, those of us who have followed your career know it's built on audacity. I mean, you try things, you have confidence, but when you look at that video, and when I looked at that video, obviously it's prescient, but are you surprised by how much confidence you're exhibiting at that age, heading to Vancouver and saying, this is it, everything's I, gonna change? Yeah, I look, I, there are times where I, I hate young Kevin Smith because he's so, you know, insouciant and he's so in his twenties and stuff. Um, but I absolutely, love that Kevin Smith as the kid that got me here and I don't know where he found that confidence because I lived his life and it wasn't like wow man I've been running around with a super eight camera since I was eight years old I had literally just seen Richard Linklater's slacker um, from the time I made that tape let me see it was February I saw it in August September October November December I make that tape in January because I leave in February so five, six months after I see a movie, like I'm very coldly like, oh yeah, I'm going to make a film now as well. I, I, this just makes sense to me. So I, I don't know, even when I watch it now, I admire his moxie so much. And I identify with my, what my dad said about him. I was like, well, at least he thinks it's gonna work out. 
Well, the um, fact that the fact that you took the time to message your parents suggests you had a very loving relationship with them, and they were supportive of you. And when we watch the documentary and we see how you explore drama in in high school, like I know from my own experience, like I didn't, I love my parents, but they wanted me to be a lawyer or a doctor, so they dissuaded me from being into music and comedy. But I'm still, I made it. I still, I mean, I'm involved in those things. So I imagine you did it because you did feel supported and loved, like you, you wanted to let them know that they built you and that now it's the rockets taken off. Is that a fair assessment? Very much so. And it was also like, they were doing me a real solid, like, you know, here there was their youngest kid who was always the baby and, and like never finished anything. You know, I finished high school, but like tried to go to college a few times and then just kind of trickled out of it and stuff. And, you know, my mom was like, you want to be a waiter? like your brother, you know, like, cause my brother's working in restaurants doing real yeah. well. And, you know, I, I, the fact that they were, that I was like, I'm going to this film school in Vancouver and they weren't like, no, you're not, you know? And even though I was 21, 22 years old, they totally could have like yanked my chain or let me know that they didn't approve or whatnot. Yeah. But they let me like follow the dream. And I know, I know my parents very well. I know they were not expecting what happened. They were just like, my mom's philosophy was like, he's gonna get make his movie and get it out of his system. And then he'll get a real job like his brother. Yeah. So I was, I think I was sitting there really like giving that to them, their appreciation because I knew I, it was far fetched. Like I was 21, 22, 22 at that point. Was it 20? Yeah, by the time I left, I was 22. So, you know, uh, it, they, they were like, look, the time to go to college was back then. And you barely did that. You're going to try this now. And yeah. this requires you to move to a different place and go to a different country and get a passport and all this stuff. But the fact that they were like, all right, go do it. I felt I had to like tell them who I was. You know what I'm saying? It's not just the same old Kev, the same old knucklehead. This is a different version of your son. Yeah. You know, at yeah. least that's what I was thinking. And, and thankfully, I was able to live into those words, live up to them. Well, we talked a little bit about Vancouver and uh, I want to talk about Canada because I think it plays a huge role, surprising role in your life as a Jersey guy. Uh, mm. Just for context, I'm from Cambridge, Ontario originally, uh, and which is just near Brantford. Uh, yeah. and, I'm, and we moved to Edmonton. My wife's family is from Edmonton. So I'm in Edmonton. A lot of hockey, Gretzky stuff. I know it comes up in the dock, but we, I wanted to, so I mean, Gretzky, hockey, Canada, that's important to you. Vancouver seems to still be a city that you view as being significant. Can you talk a little bit about what that city and maybe what our country means to you? Uh, country has always meant uh, the land of mystery to me. Like uh, Canada to me is the Texas of North America. You know, down here in, in, in America, Texas is this vast land of mystery populated with uh, characters and brave individuals and whatnot. That to me is what Canada was because my first interaction with Canada was my parents um, went to Niagara Falls when they got married for their honeymoon, as many people on the East Coast did back in the day. Um, there was an anniversary, I think I was five or six years old. Um, five, it was 1975, or six, because it was around the time that uh, the Expo Canada, yep. Yep. Expo Canada happened, um, or the Montreal World Fair, one of those, because I remember sitting- Expo in, in Montreal, yeah, that, that's around that time. Yeah, yeah. In front of the floral clock in Montreal. Yep. Yep. So my parents- take us up to Niagara Falls. Um, and you know, like, first they tell us we're going to a different country. And I was like, what? They're like, yeah, we're driving there. And I was like, chitty, chitty, bang, bang style. I think we're another country <laughs> in a car. So we drove up and we go to Niagara Falls and everything is just different enough where it's like, there are a bunch of stores I've never heard of. So you feel like you're in a movie with made up brands. The police don't wear blue, they wear red and they don't drive in cars they're on horses. And the thing that really captured my imagination was, is particularly Niagara Falls base. Uh, on the wall, there was a series of photos of dead Canadians who had tried to go over the falls in a barrel. So I'm five years old, six years old, and my father is laying this out for me, reading. He's like, well, this guy, he tried in 1829, and he got dashed on the rocks. And this one... And I'm looking at a wall of dead people and that really captured my imagination where I'm like, this is a nation full of the bravest daredevils. They're all evil Knievel up here. Like it, you can't be Canadian unless you go over the falls. It was amazing. So I left there with a big respect for the country. Uh, like my parents bought souvenirs, I still have them 
from uh, like a, a box of crayons that say like Niagara Falls on them and stuff. And so it became this very romantic place in my heart from the time I was five. Now, years after that, you introduced me to SCTV, you introduced me to hockey, you introduced me to Degrassi, and that bond only gets stronger and yeah. stronger. So much so that when I do go to film school, like, you know, they didn't have anything like it in the States, but part of the draw was like, I get to go to Canada. Like I've always liked Canada. And particularly at that point, when I went up to the Vancouver Film School in 92, I was a huge Degrassi fan. Like I had yeah. just gotten into Degrassi two years prior. So I've always loved the country. I've always felt very Canadian. I describe it thusly, and I hope uh, folks up there don't take this the wrong way, but I think there's an identity factor um, at work. And uh, I, I saw it at play when Clerks came out. There was a, a letter in the Georgia Strait where somebody was like, why won't people acknowledge the fact that Clerks is a Canadian film? Somebody thought it was a Canadian film because of all the hockey and, and stuff like that. Oh, and yeah. so I was always like, so proud of that because I'm like oh my god I was mistaken for a Canadian but I think the I think why Canadians kind of dug my stuff or particularly clerks uh, like uh, you know when I started my career especially was because there's something about New Jersey yeah. that is very similar to Canada in as much as we are both situated next to very loud very obnoxious neighbors that steal all the glory in the attack. <laughs> so, you know, I grew up in the shadow of New York, which is everything. It sets the time. It's where the television comes from. Yeah. And, you know, New Jersey is the butt of nuclear waste jokes across the river. Right. Um, Canada grows up in the shadow of America, which is like everything and huge and in your face. Yeah. And always has to deal with like, I'm sure opening up a newspaper and be like, what is America up to today? <laughs> that's so what I it's think, like. <laughs> I think there's an identity factor at work here. And that maybe that's why I truly identified with Canadians. I don't feel they have a chip on their shoulder like people from New Jersey have a chip on their shoulder growing up in the shadow of New York. Yeah. But there's a, a kind of patience to the Canadian character that oddly enough, I recognize in the New Jersey character. And I think many people would probably be like, you're out of your mind. New Jersey people are never this reasonable, but yeah. there's a patience that comes with having to be second because that other thing is so big and so attention grabby. Like yeah. it's, it's like the middle child syndrome perhaps. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, we have so that. I think, that's, yeah. I think that's what I saw in Canada. And I think that's what, early Canadians saw my early work particularly because yeah. man they just accepted me right into their bosom man from the from the time we screened clerks at the Toronto Film Festival where I met Malcolm Ingram the director of clerk this documentary um up until like I was just up in Canada with clerk we did a screening at uh we did one in Toronto at the Queen Elizabeth but in Vancouver, we did it at the Rio Theater, yeah, which I yeah. saved a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. And it's like going home. It's like, honestly, it's like it, most cats assume that I am Canadian up there. You know, yeah, it, it's yeah, only yeah. the ones that are real deep into like the trivia of it all. Like, no, he's from New Jersey. But yeah. there are a lot of people that are just like, oh my God, like, so what part are you from? What province were you from? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm from the province of New Jersey, if you could believe that. <laughs> in the limited time we have left, I appreciate all that. But in the limited time we have left, I just want to ask you two things. Were you surprised by how sentimental and emotional this documentary wound up being? You cry many times, Kevin, and it's, <laughs> uh, it's heartbreaking and it, it choked me up watching it. So I want to ask about that, if you were surprised about that, not just from your own perspective about how you come across, but others. Right. And, and finally, what do you hope people take away from Clerk? So can you speak to those two things in the time we have left? Absolutely. The, uh, yeah, I wear my heart on my sleeve and, uh, and I'm a stoner. And so that makes you even more just open and in touch, uh, in touch with your emotions and open to the idea of being emotional. Uh, no matter what. So like you can find all manner of clips of me on the internet crying over things like the Flash TV show and whatnot uh, or over the death of my dog. Uh, in this documentary, it's generally about like Jason Mewes, like uh, us getting our feet in the cement at the Chinese theater or my, my dad or something like that. But like uh, appreciation, gratitude will bring it out of me a yeah. lot. And so I don't, I really don't mind you know, I'm 51, like, I feel like I've done enough where if I want to cry, if I want to let my emotions, like, kind of run wild and be seen crying, 
I've earned it. And yeah. I've leaned into that over the course of the last like five years, particularly. And, um, you know, it's to me, it's been insanely gratifying because I watched the trickle down effect on social media where people are just like, I feel the same way and I would never admit it. And then put up yeah. pictures of themselves crying and stuff like that. So I, I'm, I'm not surprised that that wound up in the movie. That's just like part and parcel with me at this point. If I'm going to be on camera sooner or later, and he got me there for like two hours, probably going to cry. Chances <laughs> are there's going to be some tears somewhere. Because um, life is beautiful. When you're a stoner, life is so beautiful. Like everything, and you see the beauty and everything, everything's connectivity and whatnot. Sure. Uh, what do I hope people get out of the movie? is, uh, you know, I, uh, the movie goes out of its way uh, to say differently, um, but I don't feel that I'm anything special. Uh, I just feel the difference between me and most people is that I was like, I think people need to hear what's on my mind. And I took a shot. So I'm always encouraging people like, take your shot. And I'm not saying go make a movie unless that's the thing that you feel is calling you. But listen to your muse. And I don't mean Jason muse, I mean your M-U-S-E. <laughs> And the muse is not just there for creative people. It's not just for artsy fartsy people. It's that voice that tells you like, you should do this. You could try this. This would be a cool thing. And then you have another voice instantly comes down, shouts it down. So, oh, not you. Other people do that. It, it would, if, it was, if you were meant to do it, you would have done it by now. I hope that this movie teaches people to shut down that second voice. Just ignore that second voice. I've smoked it away in the last like 10 years. But anytime that voice is like, don't make yoga hosers. I'm like, we're making yoga hosers. And for better or for worse, you know, you dial in and, and you kind of go forward with your with your passion. So I'm not saying people have to write a book or make a TV show or whatnot. I'm saying there's something, there's some way to uniquely express you yeah. uh, and who you are in this world. And, you know, it's it's one thing to jump on social media and be like, this is what I feel about politics or movies, that or the other thing. That's fine. That's a form of sharing. But I mean, sharing deeply of yourself, give us the essence of who you are. Don't leave this world without letting us all know who the hell you are, man, because you are so damn special and you have so much to offer. You're a little content generator, man. So generate some content for us. Kevin, it's uh, well said. I want to thank you for this time and, and thank you for participating in this incredible documentary. I hope people check out Clerk. And uh, I just want to say thank you. I'm, I've been a fan since clerks and it's uh it's just meaningful for me to get to spend a little bit of time with you so thank you vish you're so kind man you rock many many thanks for the time you give me